Welcome back to the uh, Fostering Financial Victories podcast. Thanks for joining us again. Uh, this is going to be a little different, so I look a little different sitting at this table by myself. Um, we are having a virtual host today uh, join us. So I'm joined by Jack Neal. Um, and the topic of today is going to be uh, cryptocurrency at its finest. Um, so Jack and I, from the same hometown, uh, went to the same high school. He's a little bit younger than I am. Um, Jack is a physician by training and is the smartest person about this crypto uh, topic that I could find to come talk about it. So, um, Jack, thanks for joining us, man. I appreciate you taking some time out of your busy day. Um, tell everybody kind of how you got to where you are right now, uh, going from the computer-based world into being a medical doctor and then kind of what you're doing now. Yeah, well, first off, thanks for having me, Eric. And um, if I'm the smartest person you know in this space, you need to go to you probably some more Starbucks or, or you know something. I don't know. Um, but no, <laughs> I, I've been um, involved in it and mining and doing stuff for I don't know since probably 2013 or or something. Probably okay. 2013. I think that's whenever I moved up to Michigan. So um, yeah, it's mostly just because I'm a geek and you know there's a fun. Um, there's a fun chart if you look at it and it shows like, you know, life satisfaction and it shows geeks versus like everybody else. And so like geeks are really low life satisfaction for a long time. And then it starts peaking in like the mid twenties. Right. And uh, everybody else is goes and, and drops. So I feel like I'm coming into my element and uh, being the geek finally paid off. Uh, but, um, you know, I've been writing code and, you know, just always hacking whatever I could my whole life. I just happened to go to med school because I couldn't get a job in the IT world in 2000. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's how I got started there. And there's nothing more fun than crypto mining is one of the crypto mining and AI are probably the two most fun things to mess with because they're the most complicated things to understand. <laughs> so you um, going from the computer undergrad studying and then making a decision to go to med school. Um, you mentioned when you moved to Michigan, you got into the mining of uh, cryptocurrency. What drew you into that market to begin with as we kind of start peeling back the layers of this? Yeah, I mean, initially just a fun project. I mean, I love building computers and, you know, supercomputers and, you know, piling a bunch of hardware together and trying to keep it cool and I don't know it's just it's a fun just a fun project initially it wasn't really for the money you know I'd, I'd have been better off back then buying bitcoin than actually building mining rigs I'd have, it'd have been worth more money than what what I mined and spent <laughs> on it but but um it's just fun I mean I, I I got involved for fun it was actually okay. just a cool cool hobby so would you have ever envisioned cryptocurrency doing what it has done in the last two or three years when you first got into it? Did you see that potential? Well, if I did, I'd probably own Greenville um, or some other city. <laughs> uh, so, um, I mean, it was actually just a fun hobby and I mean, Clearly, it had some potential. I think decentralized payments and the way you can pay on chain is is cool. And you know, it's this. I'm not quite a millennial, or maybe I am, but it gets to this um, whole area that we're into, which is decentralization and you know, lack of trust in government. So just a whole bunch of things lined up all at the same time with technology to say, hey, I can send money to somebody without the government being able to say anything or do anything about it, and. Um, I think that kind of was the underpinning for why it started going. And then it became speculation. People know nothing about it, like what's actually going on. They just know what it goes up, so they buy. Um, so you've got that going on too. But um, yeah, that's. I did not see it being 60,000 by now. I figured, you know, you're probably 2,500 for Bitcoin. And there's so much, you know, fluff around that. It's just. Yeah, it's tough to say. I, I I fully assumed regulation would stamp it out. To be honest, I was I was pretty sure there'd just be some rules and it, it would stamp the hype out. But it kind of made it through. So I, I I did some research this morning before I before we started this just to see what the the current date 
um, market cap for all cryptocurrency, according to Coin Market Cap, uh, their website, was two point zero five trillion dollars in global mm-hmm. uh, dollars inside the the crypto world. Um, that's crazy to me, just to think about how much money is sitting there. But when you make a comparison, Bitcoin's got over a trillion of that. Yeah, and you know, in Apple, Amazon, to give some some scope, Amazon's one point seven trillion of a market cap. So it's a big deal, right? There's a lot of money in it. And I think for most people that, you know, you talked about the hype. You and I, I remember talking to you back in 2017, uh, the last time it kind of went really mainstream on the topic and everybody was wanting to invest in it and they didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to do it. I remember calling you saying, what do I even need to be able to know to answer questions for people? Um, it seems like we're at that phase again, especially recently. So you tell me what you've seen in the last seven, eight years that you've been watching this. Um, there are a lot of projections of, you know, some people say, hey, it could be 100,000 by the end of this year with Bitcoin being the reference. Is it different this time now that companies are investing into it and are starting to come out and bring it more to the mainstream? Is it is it different than what it was in 17 and 18? Well, just to be clear, so John McAfee has a million dollar price target. I just a want million. to make sure, make sure. Okay. You, just this is John McAfee. He's he's in a Spanish <clears throat> prison for tax fraud. So don't maybe trust him too much. But um, he he also made the software you couldn't remove from your computer. So he knows things. Um, but. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's too hard to predict, you know, what happens with it, right? I mean, clearly anything that goes up and so quickly typically comes down, and most Bitcoin bull runs have been followed by an 80% crash, and alts have crashed more than that. So odds are that's what's going to happen, right? But it does seem different. The last time it crashed, you saw what you started seeing was first you saw a lot of excitement and hype and people buying in that didn't know, you know, anything. When I started getting calls from people who don't know anything about tech saying, how do I do it? Then I started saying, well, it's time to get out. And, you know, I've gotten that now. So that feels the same, but maybe it's different, right? This time you don't have Facebook banning ads for crypto. I mean, they kind of already did, but like, you don't see a real backlash against it. Back then, after that huge hype cycle at the end of, was it end of 2017 going into 2018 or maybe it's the next yep. year. But that big hype cycle, right when it got very peaky, you saw a lot of regulation come out of starting to talk about coming out against it. You saw Google ban ads for crypto. You saw a real clamp down from private tech even. You know, regulation didn't figure it out, but private tech kind of clamped down on it uh, a little bit. And I think that helped to hurt it at that point. I don't think that's going to happen right now, right? That part's probably not going to happen. You're seeing more adoption from private tech you're seeing regulation try to come up with how to regulate it in a manner that you can still know your customer and protect against money laundering um you don't so i don't know it feels different now from all of those ways but it feels the same in the sense that you just get people all the people that uh you know just coming out of the woodwork now they've been doing it for now six months though is the problem like this started back in i think october of last year i started saying man it feels a little toppy or maybe maybe November. Um, and I went a heavy amount to cash on January 1st because I wasn't going to live through a taxation, you know, um, you know, leave. And of course, that means, you know, this run this year has been spectacular. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard to predict what's going to happen. But there's some some things that are similar, some things that are different. Um, I think you just have to figure out your risk appetite and if you plan to own 50 grand worth of Bitcoin, don't buy 50 grand worth of Bitcoin today, right? <laughs> Dollar cost average your way in slowly because I, you have no idea. I mean, you can get a 50% correction in a week. Well, and kind of speaking to that, this past weekend, the the coin, uh, I'm probably going to butcher how you say it, Dogecoin or Doggy Coin or whatever <sighs> you want to call doggy. it. Doggy. Went up like crazy. They, they and watch then, yeah, they yeah, want you down. to call it doggy coin. I'm there you sure, go. I promise you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't. They all want you to call it doggy coin. And, um, and now it's down fifty percent from what it hit uh, over the weekend. In a matter but, of three or four days. Yeah. But if, did you look back to what it was in October? 
or September, I think. It was That's pretty low. I think it was point zero zero two cents. That's and it per ran coin. for what, like forty five cents or something? Forty. 40? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I mean that's clearly that's clearly dumb, right? And um there is nothing that changed in a market. It's just how supply demand works. You know, doggy coin doesn't I'm gonna call it that, but um doesn't <laughs> really have a finite supply written into the algorithm so they can mine more if they want to. Um, you know, it just takes a proposal to do it, but there's no finite supply of doggy coin. So you know, it's kind of like, but it's very similar to GameStop, right? I mean, sure, GameStop can just issue a whole bunch of shares because they should and raise money, but the people that are piling into it, I mean, it's just, you're just, you're hoping you get out before that news happens. And sometimes I think you can ride it up and, and just wait for the news and sell like a flash when you get it. But I mean, Doggy Queen's a little different. Um, it's just, I think it's almost 99% just Elon Musk, right? It's purely just him memeing it and people love Elon. And if they, if his followers pile into the same thing, it's going to move. They could have, they could have piled into Goodyear tires, you know, I don't know, but. So um, you, you mentioned the supply of that coin. So can you talk about how Bitcoin is different as it relates to that? Yeah, Bitcoin has, at least for now, right, it, it, it has hard coded into the Bitcoin proposal and the algorithm and the code base that only a finite amount are mined during each block. So it halved last year, I think it's at 12 and a half now. So each each block that's found gets a, um, you know, a certain amount of Bitcoin is released um, or given to the miner who finds it. And that gold is basically why people run the expensive mining equipment, you know, to keep the actual chain running. Um, so Bitcoin has that hard coded into the algorithm, the amount that come out per block and that halves every uh, something like two years or something like that. And it's set that over the course of um, probably the next hundred, I think it looks like in like 80 something years, all of them would be quote found, but it's a depreciating asset class, right? You're rewarded for putting it away unlike the dollar where you're rewarded for investing it. Um, so to that, to, to that, you know, it's actually similar to gold um, and that there's less and less over time. Now you wonder, okay, so in, eight, in 80 years, why would this blockchain go away or Bitcoin go away? Because it should, right? There's no more mining to be found, no more Bitcoins to be found. We turn it off. Well, it all goes back to if the, if the miners, they basically can vote when they're mining. If they decide to change the algorithm, they could. Right. So right now there is a finite supply of Bitcoin and it's something on the order of look it up on 18 million, 20 million Bitcoin. Um, but the miners technically could vote to increase that. So just keep that in mind that if you think there's some hard coded guarantee for eternity, that there'll only be 20 million Bitcoin. That's not really true. Um, and for doggy coin, there's no cap. I mean, at okay. all. there's nothing even so it's totally different. There. Completely different. It, yeah, it's it's it's. Yeah. Okay. But it, it's so, junk. But if everyone agrees to transact in it, you can transact in junk. It's like a toy. Anything's a toy if you play with it. So anything's money right. if you accept it. I mean, <laughs> so. So with t with uh, let's talk through with with Bitcoin and, and Tesla when when they came out you know earlier this year, and Tesla starts talking about moving forward to at some point start accepting Bitcoin as as payment. I know they did a big investment into it. What does that do? Does that does that bring it to a more legit platform from the the mainstream who aren't just kind of toying and playing back and forth with it? Does that does that make it more of a of an asset in in well in those eyes? Not until he fixes the price in Bitcoin, right? Right now, the price is going to be a conversion from dollars, and as long as that's the case, it's just kind of silly. I mean, it's something, right? It's something. So the the technology behind cryptocurrency is often overlooked, I think. Um, I think people are typically just trading it like they would trade stocks in general. At least some people are. Um, talk through the, is, is the biggest advantage of crypto really the, the technology is being developed on the blockchain side of things? And then, you know, talk how that relates to what you're starting to see with these uh, NFTs that are starting to be bought and sold using that network. Uh, like if you send money through your bank to somebody, you know, that's stored in a ledger at the bank in a database, right? 
And so in theory, somebody at the bank can move it around and screw around with it and steal your money or whatever. Blockchain, because it's basically sealed with signatures, digital signatures, these cryptographic keys, um, the when you have, you know, the best way that I can explain it is like you've got a mailbox out front of your house with an address and it's a glass mailbox and everybody can see in it, right? So they know that, you know, 213 Spring Creek Court has, you know, 100 bucks in it or whatever, right? You can see it, but you can't get it, right? You got to have the key to unlock it to send $10 to the mailbox next door. Um, and so that private key is actually when you're transacting on a chain, that private key is the piece that's your special, nobody better get it, because they can unlock your mailbox and take all your money if they get it. Um, so if you want to send the money, you and all this stuff ends up being abstracted to you because it's you know handled by MetaMask or different tools. But basically that packet that's saying, I'm going to send 10 or say one of my 10 Bitcoin, I'm going to send it to my neighbor. You sign it with a private key that's handed off to the blockchain to be mined, to be written into a block. And a block is like a database ledger, like it's gonna store it and it's gonna be there for eternity. And so you hand it off and as long as the signature is valid, when a block is mined, and for Ethereum it depends on how much money you pay them <laughs> to put it in the block, it's actually more complicated, but um, they'll mine it in the block and then for eternity that is written hard-coded and it gets spread amongst every ledger in the world that's running a full node. And so there is no bank with the ledger. That ledger is everywhere. You can't undo it. Um, it's stacked into the chain permanently. And now that one that you sent to your neighbor is now in your neighbor's mailbox. And the only way they can move it is with their private key. And if they lose their private key, then for the rest of eternity, you can look in their mailbox and see $1 in their mailbox and no one will touch it. <laughs> they can't touch it. So, <laughs> yeah. So the... <laughs> The uh, other topic I saw this morning was um, there's about 20% of Bitcoin that is completely lost forever due to people losing access to the mailbox, as you described it, um, or just losing the, I guess, the code to get to it. Roughly about $140 billion worth of value. <clears throat> So what you're describing is unless they find the keys or figure out what the code is to get back into it, there's no way to ever get it out. Yeah, there's no customer service. Right. So that kind of lays into if you're going to start trading this, you got to be uh, pretty conscious about what you're <clears throat> what you're doing on that side of it. Yeah, I mean, I'm scared myself, even knowing what I know, I, I crazy cautious with moving stuff and where keys are stored and I split it up between bank safety deposit boxes and stuff right i mean but um just i normally recommend when when someone that I, contacts me and they're not very techie or at least if i judge them to be not very techie despite their own judgment of themselves um and they ask me like coinbase isn't safe where how do i move it out of there or whatever right i say look your odds of losing that if you move it are probably five percent at some point right Leave it in Coinbase with all their security. Sure, it's a bigger door, but your odds of losing that is way lower, right? Like a massive hack that takes all the crypto out of Coinbase. I'm trusting that Brian Armstrong has better security, and they must have, right? They've been around for a long time and haven't had a major hack. So do not move it out of the exchange unless you know what you're doing. Now, every crypto guru is gonna hate that, right? And say, no, that's not the right thing to do. It's just, I know I'll hear horror stories from friends who forgot to write down their seed words because they are like, oh, well, I'm not going to lose this device. I don't need the seed words. Well, and then they plug the device in two years later, the hardware wallet, and it says it has to do a firmware upgrade to connect. And then you had to do the firmware upgrade. It overwrites and you have to have your seed words or it's gone, right? So no, I, I, I don't recommend people who aren't accountants or very technical, moving their stuff off of exchanges. Um, I mean, off of Coinbase. I'm really talking about Coinbase and maybe even Gemini. So, so talking about Coinbase, you know, they made a lot of news the, the last week or so going public on the, the the normal stock exchange. Do you see that having an impact on the crypto world at all? 
I mean, I don't know all the permutations of how that could affect it. I think it's um, it's slightly silly the valuation they get. I mean, they get it because they're just printing money right now, right? I mean, they are rocking and rolling, but there's not. I mean, they have the first mover advantage, but their margins are very high. They charge high trading fees. You know, it's not. You know, it's a percent of the trade, and it's a percent of each side of the trade um to buy it and to sell it and and other companies don't do it decentralized exchanges actually pay you for being the market maker so their their margins are gonna shrink coinbase is i don't you know it still probably goes up right because people don't have a lot of options to play so it's probably going to go up but it doesn't make sense to go up it's definitely not a sure win because their revenue and their margins going to get compressed over the next you know 18 months you think that brings any more any more uh, eyes to the crypto world in general because Coinbase is now getting some major publication publicity on just going public? I don't know. I just feel like there's enough hype. Everybody knows about, I've heard about crypto now. Sure. I don't know if Coinbase being publicly traded. I mean, it does solidify some legitimacy to, to, to some degree, but I'm not sure it makes any, it, I, I can't do a permutation where it makes a massive, okay. you know, change on anything and i just i just wonder does that bring into to the to the play any more regulation now that they are publicly traded it'll probably bring some more transparency into what's up um just because now they're gonna have to report things publicly um but i'm not i'm just yeah i i don't quite have a feel for how that'll affect things other than you know whether you invest in coinbase or not and because you can already look at trading volumes if you're trying to you can i i think coinbase is going to be one of the easiest to project revenues that who you know when as they're you're doing eps maybe not eps but at least revenue projections you should be able to nail it perfectly because it's almost all their money comes from trading volume and sure. that's fairly public so that you'll you won't see a lot of earnings surprises from them, or at least you should be able to predict it and buy options to trade it <laughs> if the market's not pricing it right. Because you should be able to tell what's going to be, what the revenue is going to be for a given time period. It came on my radar a couple of weeks ago, um, just listening to other podcasts and just trying to take in just different content. And someone was talking about the NBA and what they did last year using NFTs to create revenue. And the more I dug into it, I mean, it's just pretty amazing what, what some of the price tags they've got on some of the NFT, I guess, tokens that they're basically selling on their NBA website. Um, I mean, the highest one I saw was over $200,000, and it looks like a trading card. It's just digital. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the blockchain I mean, I technology think, seems to be the advantage there. This comes from – so there's the two sides. There's one is the what's the value? Is it actually value at all? And the second is, you know, technologically. So – the value at all part, I, I can't I can't answer at all. I, I wouldn't put money up on it right now because when doggy coin can fly through the roof like that, we just have frothy markets with tons of liquidity, the money going after anything that can make money, just super high risk appetite. And I could keep going for a while, but it's not going to go forever. At some point, people are going to want to buy the land behind their house or you know build a new you know deck off the side of their you know, people are going to try to spend the money that's locked up in these games at some point right it's just sure has to happen and so you're going to see things like nfts those those things that are leveraged basically nfts like a leveraged thing on top of crypto gains and crypto gains are on top of probably the you know the 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 payments we put out last year for um COVID payment, and then that's, we got all these things layered, and probably the last one on that list is NFTs, right? So that's really the most leveraged area you can get into. Well, the the environment for trading, I know you and I have talked a little bit about this before, it's different for cryptocurrency than it is for the, the normal stock market, which is open at 930 and closes at four, and it trades just during the week. So talk to me about the advantages and maybe the disadvantages of the 24-hour, 365-day-a-year um, trading environment that cryptocurrency operates in. Well, the first would be the disadvantage is terrible. I mean, it's it's awful. Like, like once you once you get used to it or once you get into it, it's. I, I think you see this in a lot of. I mean, if you ask around to people you know who are invested, you 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 without a lot of effort you actually create an addiction right that volatility and that continuous on is that 
addicting thing that you can't stop looking. You look when you wake up in the middle of the night, you look in the morning, like it's just, it's terrible. It consumes you. Uh, so then you end up having to write bots to try to do it for you, which consumes you just as much. Um, but I think the always on is awful. It's just, you can't, you're not going to change it, right? It's, it's not a fixable thing. You just have to learn how to, um, how to avoid looking so much. If you're a trader, if you're a holder, maybe that's okay. But if you're someone who trades, it's, it's, it's just ruin real. I mean, it's just, it's an addiction. I mean, the pro side is, you know, you don't have those opening and closing volumes and that thin liquidity overnight, you know, it's, you have these weird periods where, you know, at like 11 PM China comes online. So back, maybe China will get more involved in crypto, but back before China sort of banned it ish, um, at 11 PM, you'd see a huge volume spike, right? So you could actually trade around when countries woke up <laughs> to some degree. Um, you know, and that's an interesting thing to watch just as it goes around the world, um, these volume spikes. But, um, you know, it, it means that while you're sleeping stuff, big stuff happens and you don't have any ability to um, respond. And, and, and so it's fine if you're a holder, you're just going to sit it and forget it anyhow. But if you're going to trade, it's it's um, it takes a lot of self-control. So I could definitely see where that might consume your every waking moment um, for sure. But the, you know, from the, the trading side of this, how would you, if somebody came up to you now and said, and I'm sure you're getting these calls and I think you, you alluded to it, should I put money into cryptocurrency, yes or no? And they're, they're just asking you um, your opinion of it and you know nothing about them, what would be the first few things that you would tell them that they need to be aware of, that they need to understand before they ever make that decision? Yeah, I mean, simply I'd say buy some, buy one twelfth of what you want to buy over the next 12 months each month, just set it up as a recurring buy or, or buy it however, but um, buy it that way. And then don't take it off the exchange unless you really know what you're doing or are willing to not hate yourself if you lose it. Um, because, you know, it's probably a 5% chance you screw up and lose it. So um, that's sort of the main simple things that I sp spill out to people. Okay. That's so, the shortest answer you'll get because I recite that, that one a lot. <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Do that one a lot. Um, <laughs> I think being aware of the volatility and being aware of the trading environment, I don't think most people realize that it trades 24 hours a day and it never closes, at least not initially. Yeah. Um, that's one thing I've, I've heard from folks to say, I was kind of surprised to, to find that out. Um, the volatility is also probably the one thing that I would think from an advisor's perspective. So my day job is, you know, advising clients on, on how to manage their planning. I think they just need to understand how much volatility is there. And you, you talked about it earlier, you, you see massive shifts in values really quickly. Um, yeah. And if but, you're, and if you're new to it, it's so easy to get off sides. And if you're, if again, unless you're just buying and holding and you actually mean that, like straight up mean it, and you, you got to be that type of person. But if you're going to trade it, it is so hard to not get off sides. Like you see a 20% drop and you say, oh crap, it's going to go down 40%. You sell at 20%, it goes up 15%. You say, God, it's going to go back up. I got to buy it. And you buy it and then you just get off sides and you're off sides the whole cycle, right? It's so hard to not do that. So, Jack, is there anything else that you think we should cover that kind of surface level, not getting too too far into the weeds of anything else, but um, anything else you think would be relevant for people to just have a good understanding about with this crypto world and whether making decisions of yeah. what they want to do? So, so, it, so there's new the stuff that I – and you see decentralized finance, DeFi stuff. Um, like that's the stuff that's – been very hypey, very toppy for a little while now. Um, I mean, things like Compound, Uniswap, uh, Maker, DAO, those different ones, um, you know, they've had a lot of excitement and I think a lot of smart money has moved into them, right? Doggy Coin did not have smart money move into it, right? Um, I think smart money has moved into some of the de decentralized finance stuff. Um, I think what you're going to see, and I started toying with this, uh, couple, I don't know, two months ago, um, on like Uniswap is, and this is why I'm kind of against Coinbase as a company when it comes to their margins, um, is 
if you provide liquidity, so like say you have, say you've made money in crypto already, or you just have money, you know, a, a decent amount, and you're going to provide liquidity to a market. So say that market is, you want to swap Ethereum for Bitcoin, and it's for when people want to swap Bitcoin for Ethereum. So you have an exchange, a swap market. And so when you put in money, you put in based on the current sort of ratio of Bitcoin to Ethereum, you put in equal parts of both, right? And so you become a liquidity maker. So basically you contribute to this pool, the, these equal amounts. And then based on the price on centralized exchanges, that ratio is gonna change, right? That ratio will change. And just based on arbitrage rules, buyers and sellers are gonna keep that liquidity pool about at the right balance, right? And every trade that happens, 0.3% of that money goes to the liquidity makers, right? So it's decentralized trading, right? So there's, you know, not a central authority and it's not even priced really. It's based on arbitrage to keep the, keep the ratio stable. And you make 0.3% on every trade into your pool, right? I think that it's the opposite of Coinbase, right? Coinbase, like if you want to make any trade on Coinbase, say I want to make, be a market maker, right? And I just want to say, Hey, I don't, I'm just going to put out this order. I'm, you know, currently people are paying 60 grand for Bitcoin. I'll buy it at 59,000 if it gets down there. You just put a buy order on the book. Eight or six years ago, Coinbase didn't charge fees for that if you made the book. And then they started charging fees for that up to, I think, 0.2%. But all that money goes to Coinbase, right? Whereas in decentralized finance and these platforms, the people who are making the book technically are the ones who get the fees, right? So I think you're going to see tons of money pile into these and provide tons of liquidity into these uh, decentralized finance liquidity pools because you make money on the fees. Whereas if you're just bot trading on Coinbase, you're paying fees unless you trade over a billion dollars a month. So decentralized finance liquidity pools are sort of, I think, far more interesting to me than NFTs. NFTs are... I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there's something, but I, I don't get any joy off of knowing I've got Jack Dorsey's first tweet and I, or Beeple's, <laughs> Beeple, Beeple can put out more NFTs. I don't know if you've watched how many NFTs that guy puts out. He puts out like two a day. If, if, if scarcity is why stuff's worth money, he is defeating himself. <laughs> like, he's well, so fast. <laughs> <laughs> and and I saw that there was a uh, a band uh, who was getting ready to put out an album. They were gonna put out NFTs with each album, um, as a way well, to also, create some, which was kind of interesting. Yeah, that's cool. And also, just to make sure there's more validity to the NFT, Lindsay Lohan's a big fan. So I don't know if you saw that. Lindsay Lohan's not. a big fan, right? So so I mean, if you need the Lohan validation, you've got that. Um, and I think Paris Hilton's big on it too. Like seriously, they keep coming out with like, you know, being big proponents. I I haven't heard that I name in know. a while. <laughs> Paris Hilton. I yeah, yeah, I haven't heard that one in a while. Um, she's been out of the okay. movies for a, a while. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right, Jack. If uh, I've got two questions I need to ask you that everybody's been asked that I've had as a guest. Um. If you could buy anything in the world, regardless of what it costs, what would it be? The land behind my house. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, <laughs> um, seriously, that's the that's the number one thing I'd buy right now. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right. Um, last two things you spent money on. Like significant money. Nope. Just what? last two things you spent money on. I'm sure it's Amazon, right? I don't even know it. <laughs> Probably. I think this morning I accidentally bought something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that and then um uh, not long ago we paid off all our student loans so that's our last big purchase it's not oh, really that's, a purchase, that's a big but, one there man um but yeah that's where we took most of our crypto and just went and did it so um very cool yeah. that was so, the plan stick to the plan i guess that's my other advice is when you're getting in crypto create a plan and stick to it do not let emotion do it because emotion it will lose your money all right man well um Jack, thank you for, for taking time out of your day, man. I really appreciate it. Um, hopefully this is, I know it's been fun for me. Um, always good to hear your take on a lot of this. Um, for everybody listening, 
Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you've got questions or you want to reach out to us, you can find us on our website at fostervictorwa.com. You can also uh, keep up with us on Instagram at Foster Victor Wealth Advisors. If you have questions or topics you want us to cover, just let us know. Um, Jack, you want to let everybody know how they can find you if uh, if you want to put that out there? Yeah, I'm, I'm typically down at the restaurant on Main <laughs> <we go>. uh, <laughs> every Friday at 6. So if uh, you want to show up down there at private property, um, we'll be hanging out down there. Too good. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> No, we um, we work. You know, we have spaces SoCo too, but we're here in South Carolina, so um, we have a AI company, um, and uh, so we're in Columbia mostly, and around South Carolina and some other places too, um, where our people are. So uh, yeah, hit me up on LinkedIn. You can probably post a link to it. Information contained in this podcast was intended for general use, not to be used as specific advice. For content tailored to your personal situation, please contact one of our wealth coaches.